What's up, Wizards? It's Dev, a.k.a. the Himbo Hobo from SBMTG Magic Stuff. And it is the most wonderful time of the year again, my friends. That's right. Five decks, five bucks apiece. It's been a long time since we did this, but I figure as we start to dip our toes back into paper magic early into the next year, what better way to start than just spending a few bucks on a few decks so you can play with your kids or your parents or whatever you want to do and just have some fun playing paper magic again, finally. Now, as usual, all these decks are built to play somewhat well against one another, but for the first time ever, I decided to try out the 5 for 5 decks on MTG Arena, and even though I just played in the unranked play queue, I was nonetheless surprised at the amount of games some of these decks were able to pick up. So if you're just starting out on Arena, or you just don't have a whole lot of wild cards but you want to try something new, there's some good ideas in this video for you too. And in fact, I think this is probably the most powerful 5 for 5 that we've ever done. So let's go ahead and jump into it because we have got a lot to cover today. But as usual, if you want to go ahead and like the video, that would mean a lot to me. And of course, if you want to subscribe, I would really appreciate that too. We got Kaldheim spoilers coming up. It's reasonable to assume you want to be informed for that. So sub to the channel, hit the bell for the noties. And last thing here, if you want any of the deck lists, just hit the description down there below me and you'll get all of these deck lists down there in the description. You can check them out on TCG Player because they just have the lowest prices. But let's go ahead and get into it with the first deck. Gruel Trample. I figured this would be a good one to do first because everybody likes to stomp, don't they? We can all come together on that. It turns out that there are a couple of Trample Tribal cards that I think are criminally undervalued and form the backbone of a really good deck right now. This deck starts with four copies of Proud Wild Bonder, three copies of Quartzwood Crasher, and four copies of Cargan Intimidator. Now, Proud Wild Bonder. Nobody plays with him, but he's proud because he knows exactly how good he is. This thing is really sweet. It turns all of your creatures into Thorn Elementals, effectively, if you've been playing long enough to remember Thorn Elemental. All your creatures can just deal combat damage directly to the dome. Now, by the way, important to keep in mind that if you should choose to use Wild Bonder's ability to deal damage directly to your opponent's head, that means your creatures aren't dealing combat damage to your opponent's creatures. This leads to a situation where you might lose some guys, your opponent might retain some dudes, so you often want to use Wild Bonder in a situation where it can end the game the moment it hits the table. I've been looking at this card a little bit like an Ember Cleave for all intents and purposes, in that often you want to develop your board state sufficiently before you actually attempt to cast the card. You want your opponent to be tapped down on mana before you actually cast the card. You want to make sure that you have lethal on board before blockers before you actually cast the card. So in some ways it is a bit of an Ember Cleave that can be heartless acted, so it's even more important that you make sure your opponent doesn't have available mana when you try to play your bonder. That said, when you have developed your board enough to just drop Wild Bonder and guarantee a win, it can feel really, really good, and it's not so hard to do so. There are some really good tramplers in this format, like Quartzwood Crasher, for instance. This card is about 65 cents a pop, so we can't really play four copies, but I don't know that I'd want to play four copies of a five drop anyway, but it goes really well with Wild Bonder because if you do choose to deal damage to your opponent's head through Bonder's ability, then you'll still get a huge creature thanks to Quartzwood Crasher, meaning that you're not really as worried about the crackback as you'd normally be. In practice, Crasher has won even more games upon hitting the table than Wild Bonder has, and it does have immediate impact on the game, because when you resolve it, you move to combat, get through for some trample damage, and suddenly, again, you've got some creatures to block on the crackback or just aid in your next attack step. And Crasher ain't half bad itself, it's a big old duder with trample too, so Crasher is just an indispensable creature that again is critical to the deck's strategy. Now, I was really surprised to see that Cargan Intimidator is only like 25 cents right now. I know that Mono Red isn't necessarily the most played deck in the format anymore, and Cargan Intimidator is not even in every Mono Red deck. Warriors isn't really a very supported tribe at the moment, at least. We'll see if that changes when Kaldheim comes out. So it turns out that Cargan Intimidator can be acquired on the cheap, and it's one of the best cards in the deck, too, in terms of, like, actual constructed level play. So I was really psyched to be able to play Intimidator because I didn't think I was going to be able to when putting the budget for the deck together. But this is the only creature in the deck that doesn't naturally have Trample, but you can give it Trample for just one mana if you want to get through for a guaranteed three or four damage with Wild Bonder. And it also helps that a lot of our creatures in this deck just happen to be warriors. So if you make one of your opponent's creatures a coward, it's pretty likely that you'll get through with two or three creatures in that combat step. But we gotta have some other tramplers in the deck, and we've hit 25 total creatures here, all of which besides Intimidator have trample. But we did have to scrape the bottom of the barrel a little bit. We're playing cards like Warden of the Chained as a playset, a playset of Skyclave Geopede, four Hobblefiend, and two Grotag Bugcatcher, which is the worst. 
card in the deck. It usually swings as a 2-2, and basically the only reason it's in there is to get extra damage off a of Proud Wild Bonder. You just send it through consequence-free, guaranteed shock worth of damage, basically. Or, you know, you get a 2-2 off a of Quartzwood Crasher. Just the fact that it has Trample is enough to run it because we need two drops in this deck, and if Grotech Bug Catcher is the best we can do, especially on this budget, I guess that... It is what it is, right? But Bugcatcher is still a somewhat reliable creature. That isn't the worst thing you can cast on turn two, but it's obviously not amazing either. Same thing with Hobble Fiend. Only reason we're really playing this is that it's a two drop with Trample. But hey, it's got a pretty nice threat of activation on it, right? If it gets through unblocked, then maybe you sacrifice a creature or two that did get blocked, and suddenly it gets through for four or five damage. Plus, it gets counters, so it gets bigger as the game goes on, and sometimes it can be one of your biggest creatures and really start to threaten making even bigger dudes if there's a crasher on the table. So, you know, if you have like a 6-6 six, six Hobble Fiend or something, or a 6-power Hobble Fiend, rather, and you drop a Wild Bonder, well, you just guaranteed get through with a ball lightning's worth of damage that turn it two bolts to the face son do something about that so sometimes this card will work out to get really big over the course of the game but for the most part it's just a two drop with trample so we have to play it as far as warden of the chain this is a card that i'm actually relatively impressed with because there's a few ways to make it swing right you can get a hobble fiend up to four power that's possible skyclave gop just one land drop gets it up to five power so you can swing with warden quartzwood crasher and proud wild bonder both allow you to swing with warden so it's a really good three drop and even though it's not love struck beast and it kind of sucks when it gets outclassed by a love struck beast it's still a three meta four four and those are actually still pretty decent creatures and just like love struck beast by the way you don't have to have a you know anything to make it block it can block any day of the week kid you just have to have a big dude to make it attack but again in this deck it's not too hard and on to skyclave gop last creature that we're playing well, we, we do have Evolving Wilds in the deck, so sometimes this can get up to 7 power. And if you have a Bonder in play, that's a huge chunk of damage all at one time. And you can make a pretty big creature off of a Crasher. So even though GOP doesn't have a very impressive base toughness or anything, I've still found it really, really fun and makes huge plays sometimes out of nowhere. But I did save some room in the deck for some actual spells. We've got four copies of Shock, four copies of Fire Prophecy, and three copies of Adventurous Impulse, which helps us find the Wild Bonder in the early game. We're not really doing anything else on turn one, so if we have an open green mana, we might as well fish for the Wild Bonder, the Crasher, whatever. Something to get online in the early game, a two-drop, whatever. Adventurous Impulse has been a really nice card in this deck. Aside from that, though, just removal. <laughs> Shock can go to the dome when we need it to, right? Sometimes you'll be able to sack a few creatures to to a hobble fiend that gets through unblocked get through for enough damage to put your opponent at two finish him off with shock is a situation that's occurred in testing so i wanted to bring it up here very often your opponent knows that you can't finish them with hobble fiend but if you can put them in range of shock that's your game my friend but aside from that fire prophecy is in there is just straight up removal that also helps us draw into cards like wild bonder and crasher there are a couple of creatures that are just so integral to our strategy that we have to have them almost every game and cards like impulse and prophecy help us get those creatures. Now here are your lands right here. Fairly simple affair, just like every other mana base in the video, but Evolving Wilds is really worth mentioning here. It's going to be in every two-color mana base in this video, but really works in this deck because we have a creature with landfall. That's <laughs> worth remembering, but you know, even if we were going to upgrade this deck and I wasn't worried about a $5 budget, I might still run two to four Evolving Wilds after I added my Fabled Passage. Aside from that, there's a few more red cards than green cards, I guess, so <laughs> a few more mountains than forests. Mana base has been working out perfectly fine for me. But now let's move from a mechanically tribal deck to a tribal tribal deck. Now originally, this is going to be Is It Sprite Dragon? But it turns out that Sprite Dragon is $1.25 a piece. So you can play exactly four Sprite Dragon and 56 basic lands, because I don't count those towards the price. But I'm pretty sure that's a, it's a bad deck. So at the end of the day, I decided I still wanted to play Is It, but I got to play a much more interesting deck than just Sprite Dragon, which I've already played a million times, and so have you. At the end of the day, we got Is It Wizards. Now we'll start with four copies of Rockslide Sorcerer, four copies of Umara Mystic, and two copies of Kaza Royal Chaser. I was pleasantly surprised by how cheap this card was right now. It's only about 15, 20 cents to get your hands on a copy of this. And it's obviously a really cool card. Now, full disclosure, we're not doing anything cheeky where we try to ramp into a seven drop with Kaza because those plans usually fall through. But if you just want to use Kaza as a mana accelerant every now and again in games where you're strapped for lands or whatever to ramp you into a two drop and let you double spell in a turn that that is where kaza is at her best honestly i just look at kaza as a two drop one power two toughness 
evasive haste creature with the proper creature type and that's plenty of mileage out of one card for what you're actually paying for it in this deck aside from that the rock slide sorcerer is easily the most important card in this entire deck because every non-land thing procs it so you just get to ping and then ping and then ping no matter if you're playing creatures instance sorceries literally doesn't matter as long as you don't draw a land for the turn you're going to be dealing damage with rock slide sorcerer and especially when you get multiple sorceries in play at one time this damage Damage really adds up and this is more than often than not the way you end up closing the game out but aside from rock slide sorcerer I could talk about this card all night I really need to hammer home the fact that this card is easily the most important card in the deck but Yumara mystic is really sweet too this feels like a wee dragonauts type card you know sort of super prowess if you will and oftentimes this will get through for the last few damage too especially if you can string together a turn where you're able to cast multiple spells Mystic is easily your greatest source of combat damage output, whereas Rock Slide Sorcerer is your greatest source of non-combat damage output. But when it comes to getting through for 5 or even 7 damage out of nowhere, Mystic can end a game real quick, kids, so worry about that. But there's other stuff in the deck. Turns out, like the 4 copies of Heartfire Emulator and the 4 copies of Riddle Form. Now, I was playing a couple of other wizards before I decided Riddle Form was the proper fit for the deck, but Riddle Form is just way better than all of the other wizards I tried out in this Lot. We're playing plenty of non-creature spells in this deck, so Riddle Form can pop off every turn or every other turn fairly easily, so don't worry about that, and you've still got the ability to ambush your opponents with Riddle Form. We're playing plenty of instant speed cards in this deck, so, you know, this Riddle Form can really make your opponent think twice about swinging in some of the time, too, which is one of the better functions of the card, but obviously, again, in terms of offensive damage output in combat, Riddle Form can be very, very good, and it's also anti-sweeper, anti-sorcery speed removal there are so many good things about riddle form it easily makes the deck because at its heart this is still an is it spells deck but Hardfire emulator kind of good for the same reasons again the prowess is amazing in this deck because we're playing a fair number of non-creature spells and there are going to be times too where Hardfire emulator can get in for a fair amount of combat damage or just sacrifice to kill the biggest creature on your opponent's side of the table so that mystic can get in so there's all kinds of uses for Hardfire emulator look at it as removal on a body and those creatures are nearly always good but speaking of removal on a stick, we're also playing four copies of Relic Amulet, along with four copies of Shock and four copies of Fire Prophecy, just to talk about all the removal in the deck. That's actually not all the removal in the deck, now that I think about it, but still, Shock and Fire Prophecy make their second appearance in our second deck of the day, because they're just such reliable, cheap cards that do all kinds of good stuff, right? Fire Prophecy being able to effectively draw you another card is great for getting to those Sorcerers, those Yumara Mystics, those Kaza, any card that you might need, or getting to those Relic Amulets. Amulets. The Relic Amulet is really serious, so much so that I'm thinking about making a deck with a bunch of wizards and instants and sorceries and stuff. Relic Amulet and Brash Taunter. I think it might there might actually be a hook there, but in this deck without Brash Taunter, Relic Amulet is just really good for taking out relatively big stuff even, right? Sometimes this will get four charge counters on it before you even know it, and suddenly it can take out stuff that other removal spells in the deck can't take out, and that can be really important, but other times you'll be able to tap your Relic Amulet and just shock some something, which is good enough to get in for damage, especially if your opponent has like one flyer and you want to get in with Mystic, bing bang, Relic Amulet's got your back. This card has really impressed me. But to finish off the non-lands, we're playing two copies of Stern Dismissal, which counts as removal, I guess, and four copies of Opt, which is our big card draw spell in the deck, but Opt is again a cheap, reliable card they printed over and over throughout the years and there's easy ways to get printings of it for like five cents right now and it's just one mana to draw a card activate riddle form proc your rock slide sorcerer i mean you really couldn't ask for a better card than opt for a deck like this but as far as stern dismissal goes this can also take out stuff that other removal spells might not be able to remove at that time and we can do tricky stuff with it too our opponent thinks they've got a good combat step Oh, we've got a one mana brazen borrower effect. That's uh, pretty good some of the time for really messing up what your opponent thought they could do. So I've really been a fan of Stern Dismissal. I had two extra slots in the deck and I wanted a little bit more removal. Stern Dismissal has been a great piece. You want cheap spells in this deck that proc things like Rock Slide Sorcerer and Umar Mystic, but don't cost that much mana to cast so you can afford to cast more spells in that turn. And for one mana, Stern Dismissal is a great card. Now here are your lands, really similar to the last base, right? We've got four copies of Evolving Wild, but of course, these could be temples, 
or triomes even. Some people like playing triomes over temples, and I, I, there's a few reasons to do that right now. Actually, I want to do a whole video about why I think triomes are probably better than temples. Aside from that, just some mountains, a little more mountains than islands. That's, yeah, that's the deck. That's, that's it. That's all you need. But moving on, I think our next two decks in this year's lineup are probably the best decks in competitive play <laughs> of these five decks, uh, starting with the first mono color. These are both mono colored decks, too, by the way, coincidentally. But <laughs> the first deck we'll talk about is Mono White Enchantress. Now, we'll start this deck off with four copies of All That Glitters, one of my favorite auras of all time, four copies of Sentinel's Eyes, and four copies of Seasoned Hallow Blade. So I hope you see what we're trying to do here. This is kind of the Mall of the Skyclaves or Luris deck. You can call it the Luris deck without the Luris, you know, or you can call it the Mall of the Skyclaves. Those are different decks. But what we're trying to do here effectively is stick something important onto a seasoned Hallow Blade and then just keep that Hallow Blade for the rest of the game. Bing, bang, simple as that. But there's a lot of ways that we have of protecting the various creatures that we stick these enchantments to. And there's creatures other than just Seasoned Hallow Blade that you might want to put these auras on. All the Clitters can make a lifelink creature or a flying creature really, really big and hard to deal with. Sentinel's Eyes can keep coming back over and over. And Vigilance is a very underrated ability. I want to point that out. Because when you have a lifelink dude that can swing without tapping and also stay up to block, that's, that can sometimes just end games and frustrate opponents on its own. So these enchantments are good by themselves. But of course, again, you need more than just Seasoned Hallow Blade. But Seasoned Hallow Blade is easily the best creature you could attach any of these to, despite the fact that it doesn't have Flying or Lifelink. It's just the easiest creature to protect in the deck. But that doesn't mean we don't have better stuff or more stuff. Things like Ginger Brood, Fairy Guide Mother, All Seed of Life's Bounty, and Selfless Savior are all the other creatures in this deck. Now, Selfless Savior doesn't have any cool abilities on its own, like lifelink, vigilance, flying, anything like that, but it is a good way to protect a creature that doesn't, that does have those things, so keep that in mind. If you want to sacrifice a selfless savior to protect an all seed that's wearing an all the glitters, it is almost always worth it to do that, but all seed of life's bounty, if you don't have stuff on it, is also a great, a great way of giving protection to any of your creatures that might be in trouble right now and you really don't want to lose them and the all the glitters that's attached to them, so again, plenty of ways to protect creatures that important auras are attached to in the deck, but a lot of those ways are creatures in and of themselves that you can also attach those auras to. So just a really interesting deck build right now, and Wizards has given us some really cool tools to build this deck. So but aside from that, Ginger Brute is maybe possibly the best creature in the deck to stick auras to, even more so than Season Hallow Blade if you have ways to protect it, because it's just going to get through unblocked every single turn, at least 90% of the time, because most of your opponent's creatures won't have haste. So it's just really easy to get Gingy through with a big ol' all that glitters and a sentinel's eyes on it and just laugh all the way to the bank. Plus you've got selfless savers, all seeds to protect it the entire time, so it doesn't even need to have baked in protection like Season Hallowed Blade. Oftentimes in this deck, you can take a Gingy all the way. But we've also got stuff like Karametra's Blessing as a 4 of and a 2 of Sajiri Shelter in the deck to, again, protect the creatures that we stick an aura to. We basically want to put auras on a creature in the early game and then just ride that creature for the entirety of the game. This has already been a fairly decent strategy <laughs> in Standard, and it turns out you can pull this strategy off for just 5 bucks right now. You don't get to play Luris, you don't get to play Maul of the Skyclaves, but honestly, I'm not sure that you actually have to because I've won plenty of games in testing with this stinking deck because Blessing is so ridiculous, Shelter is so ridiculous at protecting creatures, and it's a land, but... You could probably play Feet of Resistance in this slot if you wanted to. I just felt more comfortable with Shelter. But aside from these cards, we actually have to play some interaction in this deck. Aside from just like, no, I get to keep my guy spells like Blessing. So we are playing four copies of Glass Casket and four copies of Kabira Takedown, which again further lessens the land count in the deck, but it's still a great piece of removal. Even though we're not running too many creatures in the deck, it's fairly often that we'll have two or even three creatures out. So two mana for two or three damage sounds pretty bad, but at instant speed, if you have no other removal spells, you will take this 90% of the time, especially in matches against other decks on this list. Kabira Takedown can be very good, but Class Casket is just phenomenal pretty much all the time. Now, of course, this doesn't have the biggest range of targets in the world, but at the same time, 
time in the early game when you're trying to keep the board stay clear, or maybe your opponent has resolved a creature that can do something about your battleship, a glass casket can be a great way to just never have to deal with that creature again. Plus, it's an artifact, so that counts towards all the glitters bonuses. Just really solid removal piece here, and I shouldn't have to tell you that. Glass casket might be the most competitively playable card in the entire deck when push comes to shove. But here's the lance. It's 18 planes. That's all the... It's all the lands. There's effectively 24 lands in the deck after Kabira takedowns and Sajiri shelters, so don't worry about that incredibly low land count, especially considering that the deck effectively tops out at the two drop slot, so just a couple of lands really should do you in this deck. You don't need too many outs, so 18 is right where you need to be. I promise, try it. But remember back there a second ago, I promised you another monocolored deck. I can actually win games can really actually win real games of magic against not other $5 decks. <laughs> and I've got it for you because now I'm going to show you the absolute cheapest Gary deck you can possibly buy. And it turns out you have to be cheap when building a Gary deck because right now he's like 35 cents by himself. So you're you're like at a buck 50 by the time you play a play set of Gary, right? But it turns out you can still very easily make this deck right now on the super dirt cheap and win a ton of games and have fun doing it. Now this starts out with four copies of Grey Merchant of Asphodel, four copies of my Throne of Eldraine exclusive preview, Bastion of Remembrance, still love this card so much, and four copies of Marauding Blight Priest, as well as four copies of Lampad of Death's Vigil. I might as well show you all four of the engine cards at one time. Now Gary needs no introduction, so I'm not going to give him much of one. Obviously you just want to play cards to the board, keep them on the board, so that when you do eventually play Gary, win game question mark right and that's how it often works gary is the last card that gets played in very very many games with this deck because it just comes down and your opponent's at less than zero so it's just a, it's just an obviously crazy card but what's the cheapest way to build a deck around it well we've kind of got a sort of aristocrats theme which sounds like it runs a little bit counter to what we're trying to do with Gary. But if you don't draw Gary, you don't draw enough lands to play Gary, or you've already played your Gary and you need a little bit of extra damage to finish the game off, that's where this strategy comes in because Bastion of Remembrance is an unbelievable way to get just incidental drains from your opponent. You can throw your creatures into combat a little bit more liberally than you usually would in a Gary deck, knowing that you'll get extra damage when they die, you know, you can actually sacrifice three or four creatures at one time to a land pad of Death's Vigil to end the game because you'll get damage off of both land pad and Bastion at the same time. So sacking like three creatures is six life lost and six life gained on your end for what that's worth and it's often worth an awful lot. Add to that the fact that land pad is a really good early blocker against a lot of decks, even real world decks. This can block and survive against Robber of the Rich and all kinds of other creatures. So the three toughness isn't to be sneezed at and the fact that you can just finish games if you're able to get enough chip damage in in the early game or enough bastion of remembrance triggers or whatever if you have a land pad out and enough creatures on board you don't need a gary <laughs> just throw some mana into it finish the game right then and there but marauding blight priest also helps you add up that damage there have been plenty of times in testing where i've had board states that consisted of three out of four of these cards remembrance blight priest and Lampad all at the same time. And under those conditions, just having a couple of other creatures on the table can spell, you know, nine damage with just a couple of mana spend. It gets out of hand very quickly. So again, in games where you're trying to establish a board state, which you're trying to do in a Gary deck anyway, these can be invaluable if you, again, never draw the mana to play Gary, you never draw Gary itself, or Gary isn't enough to finish the game. Often these cards will be. But of course, we have to fill the board aside from all the creatures that we're playing. And it's actually fairly easy to do that with a ton of really good black one drops right now. We're playing four copies of Serrated Scorpion, four copies of Whisper Squad, and two copies of Archfiend's Vessel. The only reason that we're not on four copies of Vessel is because it costs like 40 cents right now. We just don't have all the money in the world. That's got to be five bucks. So I'm only playing a couple of copies of Archfiend's Vessel, but it does have lifelink. So if you have a Marauding Bright Pe a Blight Priest out, this act effectively does two damage in combat. That can be nice. When it does die, you can get that extra trigger off a of Bastion of Remembrance or whatever. It's a Black Pip for Gear Gray Merchant of Asphodel. 
So it's good in all those situations, but we do have ways to reanimate it in this deck to where we can get that 5-5 demon. And Archfiend's Vessel does remain one of the better cards in the deck. We just don't have the budget to play all four copies. But we do have good black one drops aside from it. Whisper Squad can help us develop our board state really, really fast. You know, turn one Whisper Squad, turn two Whisper Squad is actually not an embarrassing play sequence in this deck if we're able to play a Bastion on turn three. And suddenly we can convert those Whisper Squads into damage really, really easily. Aside from that, oh, when we also need more creatures to get pips for Gary. We need more creatures to sacrifice to land pads. So Whisper Squad is tailor-made for this deck. But aside from that, Serrated Scorpion, again, just made for this deck. You know, if we have a Bastion of Remembrance and a land pad out, we can sacrifice a Serrated Scorpion and get two damage, two life loss from its trigger, you know, a damage from land pad or life loss, a life loss from Bastion. Suddenly we're dealing like four damage for one mana by sacking our Serrated Scorpion. Again, if we have the right board states in the mid and late game, we can do some truly heinous stuff. And I've been able to deal, you know, 12, 14, 16 damage to people all in one go with this deck. And it's because of cards like Serrated Scorpion, Lampad, Bastion, Marauding Blight Priest. You just have them all on the board at the same time. You can do some really magical stuff. Now, we're also playing two copies of Call of the Death Dweller and four copies of Malakir Rebirth, which is criminally cheap right now. It's only about five cents for a copy of Rebirth, and it can do all kinds of cool stuff in this deck. First of all, Archfiend's Vessel. You play Archfiend's Vessel turn one, turn two. You can block with it and just play Malakir Rebirth, and suddenly you have a 5-5 on turn two. That flies. A crazy play we have available to us, but if your opponent tries to kill your Grey Merchant and you have a Malakir Rebirth in your hand, that can just be the end of the game right there, depending on what else is on the table. So Malakir Rebirth is just absolutely banana bread in this deck. It's good with Marauding Blight Priest. It's good with Lampad because you can sacrifice a thing to Lampad, cast um, uh, Malakir Rebirth and just bring it right back from the graveyard, getting the Enter the Battlefield triggers. You know, you can do that with a Gary, <laughs> sacrifice a Gary to a Lampad, Malakir Malakir Rebirth, get the Gary Trigger again. It's just so, it's such a nasty card. And so is Call of the Death Dweller, which even though it can't get back a Gary, it can get back a Blight Priest, a Rated Scorpion, Archfiend's Vessel, all that stuff. So it's still worth playing at least a couple of copies of Call of the Death Dweller here. Aside from that, removal. We got four copies of Grasp of Darkness and two copies of Drag to the Underworld, only because they are the cheapest, in terms of price, the cheapest black removal you can possibly play. Here are your lands. 20 Swamp, 2 Witch's Cottage. That's it. That's all. You know, Witch's Cottage can also get back a Grey Merchant or Marauding Blight Priest or any other important creature that you might need in your deck. But it's really good for getting back Gary. So keep keep that in mind. But aside from that, we've got, you know, Malakir Rebirth. So remember that there are a few more lands in this deck than the mana base would have you believe. But that brings us to our final deck and maybe my favorite deck of the video, even though... This didn't give me as many wins as the previous two decks did in Unranked. I still have a special place in my heart for this deck because like I've said a few times on the channel, I am a reformed control player. I love me some original counterspell. I love me some Sphinx's tutelage. I played control for a very, very long time. The deck that I took to my first and really only real, you know, well, not only, but my first Pro Tour qualifier. I've been to a couple of those. But anyway, the first that I the deck that I took to my first Pro Tour qualifier was Fairies back in Lorwyn days so yeah i'm a dirty horrible control player so when i set out to make a five dollar control deck i didn't think i was going to be able to pull it off but we actually did we have five dollar azorius control for you right here now, this deck starts with three of the main win conditions we've got four copies of voracious great shark two copies of realm cloak giant and one copy of inscription of insight now the most important of these cards is actually Realm Cloak Giant because a blue-white control deck needs a sweeper. And honestly, I'd like more sweepers than just Realm Cloak Giant. Now, we do have the ability to play Onto Inversion for relatively cheap, and even Shadow of the Sky is a cheap card, but both of them would have put this deck a little bit over budget. But Realm Cloak Giant, even though it's not the cheapest card in the world, it is a very cheap sweeper effect that comes with a win condition stapled to it, so you just couldn't ask for a better card if you're trying to build a budget control deck. We'll play a couple of copies, because if we played too many more copies, we wouldn't have any money left in the deck, especially if we want to play four copies of Voracious Great Shark, and I think we do. Again, this card is like 35 cents right now so we can't afford to play too many more expensive cards after we play our play set of great shark but it is very much worth it again especially in this meta where every single deck plays creatures <laughs> all four other decks play creatures so great shark can be fantastic but even in the actual meta at large great shark has been a really impressive card remember on stream 
a couple of weeks ago. Remember this, guys? We got bodied by a voracious great shark in a mono blue tempo deck because it's a good card. I've always thought it was a good card. Turns out it is. That I've actually gotten to get some games in with it. But great shark is one of the better win conditions we could hope for in this deck, too, because not only does it counter, say, a quartzwood crasher against the trample deck, but it's also a big boy on its own and can just end the game in a few bites. It's 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 a crazy card. I'm just going to let you know that right now. If you're looking for cheap win conditions, it's hard to do much better than Voracious Great Shark, but we were able to run one copy of Inscription of Insight in the deck, which does everything the deck wants. This can draw cards. This can, you know, bounce creatures when you need it to, and it can make a relatively big dude on its own. I've never made, uh, made smaller than a 4-4 with an Inscription of Insight, so this makes a win condition while also doing other things a control deck might want to do. I'll run one copy of this. But an Azorius control deck needs it some counter spells so we're going to play three copies of essence scatter one copy of negate and two copies of drawery disruption to start off the counter spell suite all in all we have something like 16 total counter spells in this deck when you count voracious great shark and you should but essence scatter negate and word disruption are all just great early game counter spells yes even negate against some of the decks in this standard but negate can obviously be a great late or mid game counter spell as well for countering great hinges and whatnot in standard ember cleaves in standard but there's plenty of targets for it within these five decks as well, if you're looking at this five deck meta. But Essence Scatter is especially good in this five deck meta, but again, very good in standard. I like Essence Scatter right now, especially when you're on the play. Essence Scatter is a fantastic card, but hasn't let me down yet. Disruption, too. A lot better than people give it credit for, but apparently people know it's a decent card because it costs 30 cents right now. More than a lot of the uh, MDFCs. <laughs> so I was a little surprised by the cost of Disruption, and we would play more copies of it if we could, but we do have budget constraints here but nonetheless don't knock draw your disruption this has countered many many a spell in testing with this deck and other decks i like me some disruption but we've also got four copies of neutralize and two copies of rewind in the deck to finish off the counter spell suite there is going to be stuff you want to do on turns with your mana so rewind can be really really good sometimes and other other turns you just want to be able to counter two spells in the same turn that's that's what rewind is really good for a lot of the time so keep that in mind and neutralize I think I've only cycled it like twice in all the games I've played with this deck. I very rarely cycle this card, but it will come up on occasion. Other, you know, sometimes you're looking for a removal spell, you're looking for the Realm Cloak Giant, you don't care about the counter, cycle neutralize. But for the most part, this is just a solid three mana counter spell. Cancel is decent in today's meta. Again, especially if you're on the play, you couldn't do a whole lot better than neutralize. As far as our removal suite, we've got four copies of Glass Casket, two copies of Swift Response, and three copies of Banishing Light. Now, along with Realm Cloak Giant, this doesn't form the biggest removal suite in the world, but it's a pretty decent removal suite, right? Glass Casket can take care of creatures nearly forever, especially if they're tokens. Then it takes care of them definitely forever. Swift Response is a very undervalued removal spell in the current meta, and I mean the, the standard meta at large. This is a very, very good card that I've been able to use effectively in nearly every game that I've drawn it. Aside from that, Banishing Light can take out any permanent type, which is really, really important for your control deck. Now, Banishing Light is always a card I've had a little bit of a problem with. I don't think Oblivion Ring is nearly as good as it used to be in modern day magic, but Banishing Light will still take out some problem cards for the moment, and sometimes for the moment is all that you need. But the last thing a control deck needs to do is draw cards. So we've got four copies of Frantic Inventory, one copy of Glimpse of Freedom, and three copies of Solemnity Vision. Now, I wanted a card that could escape from our graveyard. I wanted a way to effectively use our graveyard as another dimension. So that's why you see Glimpse of Freedom. It's not too bad to draw a card for two mana, but it's even better to draw a card three times off of the same spell in one game. So Glimpse of Freedom is very good when you do get the one copy. But, you know, we have to make room for four copies of inventory because if you play one copy, you have to play a playset, basically. So that's what we're doing, all four copies of inventory. I was going to play Opt here, but I wanted a spell that actually provided real card advantage rather than card parity or card selection. So Frantic Inventory is just the cheapest card in the format that actually does that. We'll play all four copies. So Lindy Vision, much like Draw or Disruption, can be a land some of the time, and that's important. So allows us to play more actual spells in our deck and fewer lands, but it is a really good land, too. <laughs> you know, a really good spell, I mean to say. You know, this can fish up a lot of cards in this deck, and even though it can't get things like Great Shark or Realm Cloak Giant, being able to pick up an inscription or a counter spell or a removal spell like Swift Response, very important, too. So Vision is a great card in this deck. And typical for a control deck, I bring you the most advanced mana base in the video because it has Tranquil Cove and Evolving Wilds, but it also has 
Crawling Barons, which is amazingly only like 30 cents right now. I expected this card to be 75 cents, a dollar, maybe even more than that. But it turns out Crawling Barons apparently hasn't made it into paper mat. Paper players don't know it's good. <laughs> Arena players have caught on. I don't, <laughs> I don't know why Crawling Barons price hasn't reflected its playability on Arena because it seems like almost every other deck has copies of Crawling Barons. <laughs> but, yeah, Crawling Barons is our other win condition in this deck and just like in other standard decks that run Crawling Barons, it is kind of surprising how effective a win condition Barons can be in some games. Don't don't understate. Don't undervalue Barons. A ridiculously good card, especially if you're just looking for a way to spend your mana at the end of a turn, you want to offload the rest of it to spend it effectively. Barons is just, well, it's a delicious magic card. Very good extra win condition that really costs like no opportunity cost whatsoever to play and really doesn't cost that much money to play either, so why not make room for a couple of copies? But we did it, y'all. We made it to the other side of the 5 for 5. Another year, another 5 for 5 in the book, and they get better every year because Wizards keeps printing better and more complex cards in the common and uncommon slots. So, like, these decks get better every single year that I do this video. And again, I think this year these are the best ones. That Mono White Enchantments deck, I'm serious. If you're going to try a deck in, uh, out of this video in Arena, on the ladder, give it, I mean, give it a shot. You might want to upgrade it slightly. Maybe Speaker of the Heavens goes in. You make it a Luris deck. There's only a couple of upgrades to make to it. It's just, really, just, the deck is fire. Uh, same thing with the Gary deck. I mean, you might want to add Ayara, Agadim's Awakening, and some stuff like that. But deck is actually really good on its own. <laughs> I, was, I was amazed <laughs> that like, Wizards gave us the ability to make some actual budget decks. And that's me saying that. I have actually earlier this year said that I don't think that budget decks are as viable as they used to be because, you know, you can only play the best cards in your deck nowadays and the best cards are really expensive. Uh, but this doing this experience, made, experiment, uh, made me shut my mouth a little bit because again, I was amazed at the performance of a couple, if not all, but a couple of these decks. Um, so try them out if you get a chance to, whether it's in paper, you know, order them, play them over the holidays or for New Year's with your family or whatever, your pod, your roommates, whatever. If you want to play some paper magic again with brand new decks, this is a good way to do it for a relatively cheap cost. And if you're watching this in 2021 and everyone's vaccinated and we're back into the world, then feel free <laughs> to order some decks and play these at FNM or with your buddies or whatever. But in any case, it was just really good to do budget content again. It feels like it's been too long since I've really done an actual budget deck, much less $5 decks. So I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you get a chance to really play some of these because they actually feel really powerful for decks just full of uncommons and like random junk rares. So <laughs> give them a shot if you can. Again, links in the description to all these deck lists um, to T over on TCG Player because again, they're just, they have the best prices. So <laughs> go over there. And aside from that, remember, like the video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you enjoyed the content. Hit the bell for notifications. Kaldheim spoilers coming up and a bunch more content aside from that. So, you know, if you if you want to do it, you don't have to. Um, same thing with the Patreon. If you want to help support the channel, it's a dollar a month to vote on the content that we do around here and on the Twitch channel for that matter. So if you want to affect the course of YouTube and Twitch history, a buck a month is all it takes. Five dollars a month, I'll send you a signed card. Ten dollars a month, then you'll get your name in the credits on some videos, mostly deck techs and stuff. And um, you might get your deck doctor over on Twitch, which will inevitably make it to YouTube in a, in, in a video form. So yeah. if you want any of that, you can join the other tiers. But all I really ask you is a dollar to vote on content and stuff. It really helps me out a lot. But aside from that, watch me play magic at twitch.tv slash svmtgdev. And uh, follow me on Twitter at svmtgdev as well. I got to get out of here because this video is probably eight hours long already. I love you guys, and I'll catch you cats later. I'm Dev from the place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Spread love and be kind.